This is the Hoops 8 Tournament Preview Show. Here's sports director Travis Lee. Well, good evening and welcome. The magic of the tournament is upon us. Who will be holding the gold ball the first weekend in March this year? Over the next hour, we'll delve into each of the five boys and girls tournaments. We'll explore the storylines and key players we'll be watching over the next three weeks. Plus, later in the show, we'll reveal the 10 semifinalists for Mr. and Miss Basketball. A reminder for the best in tournament coverage. Join us every night of the tournament at 11 o'clock for all the recaps, the storylines from the prelims to the state finals. Hoops 8 only on WMTW. Now we do appreciate that thousands of fans are tuning in tonight to watch our show. It's humbling. A special shout out to the Wyndham Eagles boys basketball team as we take a live look at their watch party tonight. We've also heard the Mount Ararat girls are down the road at the Seacoast Fun Park where they just got off the slopes and they're watching from the parking lot. So like many other communities coming together to celebrate basketball, the Eagles coming off a school record 16 win regular season. Certainly one of the great stories heading into this tournament. Now, Wyndham has some time off. They get a bye through to the semifinals where they'll face the winner of Lewiston and Oxford Hills. They went 4-0 versus those teams in the regular season. Joining me now to talk about the success of the Eagles, senior Eric Bowen. Eric, thanks for joining us to talk some hoops here. A 16-2 regular season. I knew you guys thought you were good, but did you think you were that good this year? Yeah, definitely. Uh, all these guys prepared all off season and every day in practice. So this season has been no surprise to us, really. No surprise. OK, how did it all come together? You said in the off season that you're a group that has been together for a while. What can you explain the chemistry? Yeah, we have a very close, uh, tight knit group here and uh, we get together all the time and play and every day in practice we take it super serious. So we're always trying to be the best we can be. Yeah, so, so you got really just bonded us and brought good chemistry. Yeah, you got, you've had a little bit of a layoff here, and then you, you you get through to the semifinals right away. I know everybody's excited that you you hit the school record in wins. How do you kind of refocus and you know achieve that goal that you guys want? Yeah, so we just try to take it one day at a time. Put the regular season behind us. You know, it's the postseason now, new season, and any league, any team in this league can win on any night. So we got to prepare each and every day. Awesome. Eric Bowen and the Wyndham Eagles getting ready for the tournament coming up. They go in as the number one seed in Double A North. Congratulations, Eric. We appreciate uh, you guys hanging out tonight to watch the show, and we'll check in with Double A North a little bit later in the show. Now, this season came with a major shakeup in the national rules for high school basketball, the elimination of the one and one free throw. But the rule change that is an annual debate in Maine is the addition of the shot clock. It's a topic that comes up in every basketball committee meeting, but I'm told there isn't an overwhelming majority of schools pushing for it. So until then, the debate continues. A December night. It could be any gym in Maine. A tie score with just under a minute to play. And a team holds the ball for the last shot. Would Maine basketball be better if there was a shot clock? coming from as far as like it's a money thing it's a staffing thing like we already have issues with staffing just getting the book and the clock I get that but I think it could really help looking for a faster paced game all of the coaches we spoke with felt the clock wouldn't change the tempo of the game much years ago um, we went down and played teams in Massachusetts that had the shot clock and it, it was kind of exciting for our kids to do that and what I realized playing, I think, two or three games that weekend that uh, we either shot it well before the, or we turned it over, but it didn't really become, you know, an integral part of the game. Looking into the crystal ball, how might a shot clock change the game? I think you'll see that. Again, it goes back to the tactic. Not only that, but you'll probably pressure the ball a little bit, so they only have 20 seconds left when they come across midcourt. I think you'll see a lot more zones and you'll see a lot more bad shots, hurried shots, rush shots. So it takes a little bit of that away. The new foul rule means the one and one is gone. That gave coaches a tool to try and overcome a deficit late in games. A shot clock could give them a new way to come back. It would take away that time and score situation that you had when, at least when you had the team fouls at seven, you knew I got a couple of, I can burn here on the one and one and maybe they won't get a basket. So now we've stopped the clock that way. 
Now we've taken that out of there. I think to have a shot clock, I think, would be the right thing to do now that the rules have changed. Many coaches put themselves in one camp or another. Maine's winningest active coach looks at it two ways. Was you for it or against it? Well, it depends on my team that year. <laughs> if I'm the underdog and I want to hold the ball a little bit and make the other team work on defense, then I would probably be against it. But if I got the better team and I want to play up-tempo, up I would be for it. Not a surprising answer from a coach who's close to 600 wins. My expert guest riding shotgun tonight is always Michael Hoffer of the Forecaster. Michael, shot clock, no shot clock, or does it depend on when your deadline is? Uh, well, first of all, Travis, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. I'm glad we have so many people watching. I feel like I'm shooting a pressure free throw at the end of a game here with so many eyes on me. But, you know, I not to get uh, to play too far in the middle of this, but I'm kind of like Coach Halligan on this. I... I think it would be great to have a shot clock. If, if it were easily implemented, absolutely. I don't know that it's as necessary as a lot of the really vocal critics will suggest that it is. Uh, you know, bring it on if it's at all possible, but I still think we're several years away. All right, Michael, you know, I'm gonna make a lot of enemies. So I'm kinda in your camp that uh, I, don't think we, I don't think we need one. You know, one of the cool things about Maine basketball, high school basketball, is it has no shot clock. And if you've ever seen someone try and run a minute off the clock, it's pretty hard to <laughs> Doesn't do. Doesn't work. Pretty hard to do. Uh, if we had a bunch of teams that could do that and we're doing that all the time, then maybe I would change my mind. You know, one thing that Coach Leach brought up was tools for coaches to use at the end of a game when they are in a situation where they're trying to come back. That's maybe where you could win this argument in my mind is giving yeah. a coach a tool to make more for a much more exciting game. All right, Michael, we will check back in with you in a second. Another rule implementation for the tournament, the use of video replay at the end of games to determine if the shot was taken before time expired. Also, it can be used to differentiate a two or a three pointer. This after a Will Davies controversial game winner in the AA South Championship last year. Remember, this doesn't apply to prelims and quarterfinals. The technology is only available starting with the semifinals. All right, let's start talking about these tournaments. Want to talk about a winning career? Oceanside junior Bailey Breen and her junior classmates have won 71 of the 72 high school games they played. They entered the B South Girls Tournament as the front runners. Lake Region won seven of its last eight entering the playoffs. The Lakers have a balanced scoring attack with Ava Smith, Margot Tremblay, and Bella Smith all scoring in double digits. With only nine players, Wells isn't deep, but Marin Maxson gives the Warriors one of the bracket's premier players. Madomic Valley won 14 games for the first time in 13 years. The Panthers like to play full court, and they have size to match up. Kaitana Williamson leads the way on offense. Spruce Mountain rolled through the region last year as the two seed, winning all three playoff games by double digits. The state runner-up has plenty of experience back, led by Jaden Pingree. Bailey Breen is filling the stat sheet, scoring 30 points and grabbing nine rebounds a contest. She affects all aspects of the game. Sophomores Renee Ripley and Aubrey Hoos have each doubled their scoring from a year ago for the Mariners. Reigning B champ Ellsworth ran the table in the North at 18-0, but last year nobody thought that anyone was going to take down Oceanside and Spruce Mountain managed to do that. Michael, let's talk Class B South girls. Right, and let's not forget Oceanside barely survived its quarterfinal last year. Yarmouth had them on the ropes and that Yarmouth Spruce Mountain uh, quarterfinal next Saturday, it's going to be a 9 a.m. tip time. You never know what to expect with a game that early. You know, that's a long ride from Jay at that hour. That's going to be a long ride from me, 10 minutes from the Expo at that hour. So, you know, who knows how they're going to perform in that first game because Yarmouth is a very dangerous team. But I feel like you know, Oceanside, especially after falling short when everyone was crowning them last year, they're going to be on a mission this season. They're going to be really tough to dethrone. Yeah, they have been uh, on a roll. Uh, remember that Madomic is the only team that's really stayed close with Oceanside this year. They've lost to them twice by eight and nine points. And you know, like I said, Marin Maxson and that small group at Wells, yeah. they've got some players that can put the ball in the basket. Could be a, uh, an upset special coming out of that seed that they are in right now. Yep. As we head to our first TV timeout, our boys' plays of the year. Moga Yanga of Deering the Steel and the Major Throwdown. More levitation. Griffin Gammon, the alley oop for Gorham. Check out Wyndham's Crady Dixon hanging in air for three, yes. And Closing out the final seconds of the half, Morse's Kalen Gould, the rejection to Jack Delano, to Trace McFarland beating the buzzer. More tournament preview show after this.